Stanley Cunitz, 1905 to 2006, was a Port Laureate of the United States twice, in 1974 and 2000. He wrote poetry and published it until he was 100. Educated at Harvard, he taught at numerous colleges, including Columbia, 1967 to 1985. In 1959, Cunitz won the Pulitzer Prize for Selected Poems, 1928 to 1958. Stanley Cunitz wrote in Reflections, quote, years ago I came to the realization that the most poignant of all lyric tensions stems from the awareness that we are living and dying at once. To embrace such knowledge and yet to remain compassionate and whole that is, a consummate, that is a consummation of art. I like to think that it is the poet's love of particulars, the things of this world, that leads him to universals. At my age, Stanley continues, after you're done, or ruefully think you're done, with the nagging anxieties and complications of your youth, what is there left for you to confront but the great simplicities. I never tire of bird song and sky and weather. I want to write poems that are natural, luminous, deep, spare. I dream of, I dream of an art so transparent that you can look through and see the world, end of quote. The magnificent readers are, in order of appearance, Corinne Conley, Garen Berry, Tony Sawyer, John Towie, Kay Wiseman, Helen Richmond. Here's Corinne Conley. Particular Lullaby. Declines at evening from your eyes, like summer slipping down a tree. Your noon-high pride, but not your wise, your sensitive, pleased beauty. The ebb of spirit from the vase of woman is the hurt extreme of conscious breath. Bewilder your thighs. Wrap your long thought in a dream. By image of all hush, a mist of blossom on the feminine bow. Annul the runner in your wrist, the small clock throbbing in your brow. On present time's derisive hope, then break, O oh, ever of your smile, sunbreak of lips from tropic sleep, dazzle the impossible, meanwhile. I dreamed that I was old. I dreamed that I was old, in stale declension, fallen from my prime, when company was mine, cat nimbleness and green invention before time took my leafy hours away. My wisdom, ripe with body's ruin, found itself tart recompense for what was lost in false exchange, since wisdom in the ground has no apocalypse or Pentecost. I wept for my youth, sweet, passionate young thought, and cozy women dead that by my side once lay. I wept with bitter longing, not remembering how, in my youth, I cried. Night Letter. The urgent letter that I try to write, night after night to you, to whom I turn. The staunchless word, my language of the wound, begins to stain the page. Here in my room with my unkenneled need, the Faustian dog that chews my penitential bones. I hope and I do not hope. I pray and mock my prayer, twisting my coils, this dangling life of mine. Now, 12 years come of age and me unpleased with all my ways my very littlest ones, my part, my lines, unless you hold them dear. Where is your ministry? I 
I thought I heard a, a piece of laughter break upon the stair, like glass. But when I wheeled around, I saw disorder in a tall magician's hat, keeping his rabbit madness crouched inside, sit at my desk and scramble all the news. The strangest things are happening. Christ, the dead, pushing the membrane from their face, salute the dead and scribble slogans on their walls. Phantoms and phobias mobilize, thronging the roads and in the bitches streets, the men are lying down. Great crowds with fractured wills, dumping the shapeless burden of their lives into the rivers where the motors flowed. Of those that stood in my doorway, self-accused, besmirched with failure in the swamps of trade, one put a gun in his examiner's hand, making the judgment loud. Another, upon the asylum floor, plays with toys, like the spiral of a soul balanced on a stone or a new gadget for slicing off the thumb. The rest whirl in the torment of our time. And what have we done to them that what they are shrinks from the touch of what they hope to be? Pardon, I plead, clutching the fragile sleeve of my poor father's ghost return to howl his wrongs. I suffer the 20th century. The nerves of commerce wither in my arm. Violence shakes my dreams. I am so cold, chilled by the persecuting wind abroad, the oratory of the rodent's tooth, the slaughter of the blue-eyed towns, and principle disgraced, and art denied. My dear, is it too late for peace? Too late for men to gather at the wells to drink the sweet water? Too late for fellowship and laughter at the forge? Too late for us to say, let us be good to one another. The lamps go singly out. The valley sleeps. I tend the last light shining on the farms and keep for you the thought of love alive, a scholar's dungeoned in an ignorant age, tended the embers of the Trojan fire Cities shall suffer siege and some shall fall, but man's not taken. What the deep heart means, its message of the big, round, childish hand, its wonder and simple, lonely cry, the bloody envelope addressed to you is history that wide and mortal pain. Now in the suburbs and the failing light, I followed him. And now down sandy road, whiter than bone dust, through the sweet curdle of fields, where the plums dropped with their load of ripeness, one by one. Mile after mile I followed with skimming feet, after the secret master of my blood, him, steeped in the odor of ponds, whose indomitable love kept me in chains, strode years, stretched into bird, raced through the sleeping country where I was young, the silence unrolling before me as I came, the night called like an orange to my brow. How shall I tell him my fable and the fears? How bridge the chasm in the casual tone, saying, the house, 
the stucco one you built, we lost. Sister married and went from home and nothing came back. It's strange from where she goes. I lived on a hill that had too many rooms. Light we could make, but not enough warmth. And when the light failed, I climbed under the hill. The papers are delivered every day. I'm alone and never shed a tear. At the water's edge, where the smothering ferns lifted their arms, Father, I cried, return. You know the way. I'll wipe the mud stains from your clothes. No trace, I promise, will remain. Instruct your son, whirling between two wars in the Gemara of your gentleness, for I would be a child to those who mourn and brother to the foundlings of the field and friend of innocence and all bright eyes. Oh, teach me how to work and keep me kind. Among the turtles and the lilies, he turned to me the white, ignorant hollow of his face. The Old Clothes Man. Have you any old clothes to sell? The years make a stain you can't conceal. Your fabric's eaten. You discard that part of your life for which you cared. You pluck a thread from your cuff. It winces straight to your shoulder. Ambition grieves in trunks and bags, moth-featured, minces from closets, beating empty shelves. History stagnates in your house. I smelt the ruinous time will buy your waste of talent. There's an ooze of souls too virulent to die. Contagious on the baffling walls, you sit and watch the ceiling crack. Horror sifts through and softly falls from worlds beyond the zodiac. You fear the unappeasable bone that growls in your breast and the mind's long feather, the heart that imitates a stone, until your hands grow fast together. And violence unstrings your voice. I know what hangs behind your stare, spoiling with conscience and disuse the uniform you never wear, the fitness and the pride so vilely dishonored, the smiling target mouth, Innocence ambushed in the sharp volley, reeling before the huntsman of youth. Therefore, I come to mobilize your poor blind wounds, as in the coat, the form betrayed, the defeated eyes, my brother, my groom, my dear recruit. There will be skirmishing and loot and fires to light our marches. Let the enemies of life beware when these old clothes go forth to war. When the light falls. When the light falls, it falls on her in whose rose-gilded chamber a music strained through mine turns everything to measure. The light that seeks her out finds answering light within and the two join hands and dance on either side of her skin. The lily and the swan attend her whiter pride while the courtly laurel kneels to kiss his mantling bride. Under each cherry bough, she spreads her silken cloths as the rumor of a wind to gather up her deaths. For the petals of her heart are shaken in a night, whose ceremonial art is dying into light. The approach to Thebes, in the zero of the night, in the lipping hour, skin time, knocking time, when the heart is pearled and the moon squanders its Uranian gold, she taunted me, who was all music's tongue, Philosophies and wildernesses breed of shifting shape, half jungle cat, 
half dancer, night's woman petal, lion scented rose, to whom I gave, out of a hero's need, the dolor of my thrust, my riddling answer, whose force no lesser mortal knows. Dangerous? Yes, as nervous oracles foretold. Who could not guess the secret taste of her? Impossible wine. I came into the world to fill a fate, and punished by my youth no more. What if dog-faced logic howls? Was it art or magic multiplied my joy? Nature has reasons beyond true or false. We played like metaphysic animals whose freedom made our knowledge bold before the tragic curtain of the day. I can bear the dishonor now of growing old, blinded and old, exiled, diseased and scorned, the verdicts bitten on the brazen gates, for the gods grant each of us his lot, his term. Hail to the king of Thebes, my self-ordained, to satisfy the impulse of the worm, be mummied in those famous incestuous sheets, the bloodiest flags of nations of the curse, to be hung from the balcony outside the room where I encounter my most flagrant source. Children, grandchildren, my long posterity, to whom I bequeath the spiders of my dust, believe me, whatever sordid tales you hear, told by physicians or mendacious scribes of beardless folly, consanguineous lust, fomenting pestilence, rebellion, war, I come prepared, unwanting what I see, but tied to life. On the royal road to Thebes, I had my luck, met a lovely monster, and the story's this. I made the monster me. The War Against the Trees. The man who sold his lawn to Standard Oil joked with his neighbors come to watch the show with the bulldozers drunk with gasoline tested the virtue of the soil under the branchy sky by overthrowing first the privet row for Scythia forays and hydrangea raids were but preliminaries to a war against the great grandfathers of our town. So freshly locked and maimed, they struck and struck again, and with each elm, a century went down. All day, the hireling engines charged the trees, subverting them by hacking underground in grub dominions, where dark summer's mole rampages through his halls till a northern seizure shook those crowns, forcing the giants to their knees. I saw the ghosts of children at their games, racing beyond their childhood in the shade, and while the green world turned its death-foxed page, and a red wagon wheeled, I watched them disappear into the suburbs of their grievous age. Ripped from the craters much too big for hearts, the club roots bared their amputated coils, raw gorgons marred blind, matted blind, whose pox and scars cried moon. On a corner lot, one witness moment caught in the rear view mirrors of the passing cars. To the reader from Charles Baudelaire, au lecteur. Ignorance, error, cupidity, and sin possess our souls and exercise our flesh. From force of habit, we 
cultivate remorse as beggars entertain and nurse their lice. Our sins are stubborn, cowards when contrite. We overstuff confession with our pains. And when we're back again in human mire, vile tears, we think, will wash away our stains. Thrice potent Satan in our cursed bed lulls us to sleep, our spirit overkissed, until the precious metal of our will is vaporized, that cunning alchemist. Who but the devil pulls our waking strings? Abominations lure us to their side. Each day we take another step to hell, descending through the stench, unhorrified. Like an exhausted rake, who mouths and chews the martyrized breast of an old withered whore, we steal in passing whatever joys we can, squeezing the driest orange all the more. Packed in our brains, incestuous as worms, our demons celebrate in drunken gangs, and when we breathe, that hollow rasp is death, sliding invisibly down into our lungs. If the dull canvas of our wretched life is unembellished with such pretty wear as knives or poison, pyromania, rape, it is because our soul's too weak to dare. But in this den of jackals, monkeys, curs, scorpions, buzzards, snakes, this paradise of filthy beasts that screech, howl, grovel, grunt in this menagerie of mankind's vice, there's one supremely hideous and impure, soft-spoken, not the type to cause a scene. He'd willingly make rubble of the earth and swallow up creation in a yawn. I mean, ennui, who in his hookah dreams produces hangmen and real tears together. How well you know this fastidious monster, reader. Hypocrite reader, you, my double, my brother. This next poem has two epigraphs. One is by James Joyce from Finnegan's Wake. Oh, tell me all about Anna Livia. I want to hear all about Anna Livia. Well, you know Anna Livia. Yes, of course, we all know Anna Livia. Tell me. Tell me now, you'll die when you hear. The next one is a quote from Dante. I'll try to do the Italian. It's Vita Nova. And I believe it refers to the last three lines in the poem. Ed io sorridendo li guardava a nulla dice loro. The class will come to order. Amid that platonic statuary of athletes playing their passionate and sexless games, the governors to be struck careless on the lawns, the soldiers' monument, the sparrow bronzes through that museum of Corinthian elms, I walked among them in the soliloquy of summer, a gravel scholar. Our Irish friend had counseled silence first, he did not mean the silence of the cowed, but hold your tongue, sir, rather than betray. Decorum is a face the brave can wear in their desire to be invincible. And so to hear a music not prescribed, a tendril tune that climbs the porches of the ear, green, cool like cucumber vine, what if the face starts threatening the man? Then exile, cunning. Yes, old father, yes. The newspapers were right. Youth is general all over America. The snow will not be falling till next winter. There is no hurry yet to take my journey. The almonds bloom, she wrote. But will they hold while I remain to teach the alphabet? I still must learn the alphabet on fire, those wizard stones. As always, where the text ends lurks the self, 
so shamed and magical. Away! Who stays here long enough will stay too long. Time snaps her fan, and there's her creature caught, fixed in the pleatings fated to return, and thin as paper in the mother folds. Absurd, although it may seem, perhaps there's too much order in this world. The poets love to haul disorder in, braiding their wrists with long mistress hair, and when the house is tossed about our ears, the governors must set it right again. How wise was he who banned them from his state? Oh, tell me a tale before the lecture bell. I swear, artificer, I swear I saw their souls awaiting me with notebooks, notebooks primmed. The lesson for today, the lesson, what? I must have known, but did not care to know. There is a single theme, the heart declares, that circumnavigates curriculum. The letter in my pocket kissed my hand. I smiled, but I did not tell them. I did not tell them why I smiled. The Portrait. My mother never forgave my father for killing himself, especially at such an awkward time and in a public park that spring when I was waiting to be born. She locked his name in her deepest cabinet and would not let him out, though I could hear him thumping. When I came down from the attic with the pastel portrait in my hand of a long-lipped stranger with a brave mustache and deep brown level eyes, she ripped it into shreds without a single word and slapped me hard. In my 64th year, I can feel my cheek still burning. The Magic Curtain. At breakfast, mother sipped her buttermilk, her mind already on her shop, unrolling gingham by the yard, stitching her dresses for the Boston trade. Behind her, Frida with the yellow hair, capricious keeper of the toast, buckled her knees as if she'd lost balance and platter, then winked at me blue-eyed. Frida, my first love, who sledded me to sleep through snows of the Bavarian woods into the bell song of the girls with kinds of kisses mother would not dream. Tales of her wicked stepfather, a dwarf, from whom she fled to Bremerhaven with scarcely the, t the tatters on her back. Riddles, nonsense, leader, counting songs. Ein, zwei, drei, vier, fünf, six, sieben. Wo ist denn mein Liebster, er geblieben? Er ist nicht hier, er ist nicht da. Er ist fort nach Amerika. Be sure, Mother said briskly at the door, that you get Sonny off to school on time, and see that he combs his hair. How could she guess what we two had in mind? Downtown at the Front Street Bijou, spelled B-I-J-O-U, we were, as always, the first in line with a hot nickel clutched in hand, impatient for the perils of Pauline, my Frida, in her dainty blouse and skirt, I in my starched white sailor suit and button shoes, prepared to hang from cliffs, twist on a rack, be tied to rails. School faded out at every reel. The iron claw held me in thrall. Cabaria taught me the Punic Wars. At bloody Antietam, I fought on Griffith's side. And Keystone cops came rumbling on the scene, 
in outsized uniforms, mustached, with thick browed faces dipped in flour, to crank the Lizzie's that immediately collapsed. John Bunny held his belly when he laughed. Ladies politely removed their hats. Cyrus of Persia stormed the gates, upsetting our orgy at Belshazzar's feast. Then Charlie shuffled in on bunioned feet. We twirled with him an imaginary cane and blew our noses for the gallant poor who bet on a horse, the horse that always loses. Blanche Sweet, said Frida, had a pretty name. But I came back with Arlene Pretty, and even sweeter, Louise Lovely. Send me your picture, Violet Mercero. Lights up. Ushers with atomizers range the aisles, emitting lilac spray. We lunched on peanuts and Hershey bars and moved to the Majestic for the two o'clock show. Five... Four, three, two, one. The frames are whirling backwards, see? The operator's lost control. Your story flickers on your bedroom wall. Deaths, marriages, betrayals, lies, close-ups of tears, forbidden games, spill in a montage on a screen. With chases, pratfalls, custard pies, and soars. You have become your past, which time replays, to your surprise, as comedy. That coat hanger neatly whisk your coat right off your back. Soon it will want your skin. Five, four, three, two, one. Where has my dearest gone? She is nowhere to be found. She dwells in the underground. Let the script revel in tricks and transformations. When the film is broken, let it be spliced where Frida vanished one summer night with somebody's husband, daddy to a brood. And with her vanished from the bureau drawer, the precious rose enameled box that held those chestnut-colored curls clipped from my sorrowing head when I was four. After the war, an unsigned picture card from Dresden came with one word, Liebe. I'll never forgive her, Mother said. But as for me, I do, and I do, and I do. Reading in Lipo how the peach blossom follows the water, I keep thinking of you because you are so much like Chairman Mao. Naturally, with the sex transposed and the figure slighter, loving you is a kind of Chinese guerrilla war. Thanks to your light foot genius, no eighth root army kept its lines more fluid, traveled with less baggage, so nibbled the advantage even with your small bad heart, you made a chance of, you made a dance of departures. In the cold spring rains, when last you failed me, I had nothing left to spend but a red crayon language on the character of the enemy to break appointments, to fight us not with its strength, but with his weakness, to kill us not with his health, but with his sickness. Pet. Spitfire, blue-eyed pony. Here's a new note I want to pin on your door. Though I'm 10 years late and you are nowhere. Tell me, are you still mistress of the valley? What trophies drift downriver? Why did you keep me waiting? The Illumination. In that hotel, my life rolled in its socket, twisting my strings. All my mistakes from my earliest bedtimes rose against me. 
The parent I denied, the friends I failed, the hearts I spoiled, including at least my own left ventricle, a history of shame. Dante, I cried, to the apparition entering from the hall, laureled and gaunt in a cone of light. Out of mercy you came to be my master and my guide. To which he replied, I know neither the time nor the way, nor the number on the door, but this must be my room. I was here before. And he held up in his hand the key which blinded me. King of the river. If the water were clear enough, if the water were still, but the water is not clear and the water is not still, you would see yourself slipped out of your skin, nosing upstream, slapping, thrashing, tumbling over the rocks till you paint them with your belly's blood, thinned ego, yard of muscle that coils, uncoils. If the knowledge were given you, but it is not given, the membrane is clouded with self-deceptions and the iridescent image swims through a mirror that flows you would surprise yourself in the other flesh, heavy with milt, bruised, battering toward the dam that lips the orgiastic pool. Come bathe in these waters, increase and die. If the power were granted you to break out of yourselves, but the imagination fails and the doors of the senses close on the child within, you would dare to be changed as you are changing now into the shape you dread beyond the merely human. A dry fire eats you, fat drips from your bones, the flutes of your gills discolor. You have become a ship for parasites. The great clock of your life is slowing down and the small clocks run wild. For this, you were born. You have cried to the wind and heard the winds reply. I did not choose this way. The way chose me. You have tasted the fire on your tongue till it is swollen black with a prophetic joy Burn with me. The only music is time. The only dance is love. If the heart were pure enough, but it is not pure, you would admit that nothing compels you anymore. Nothing at all abides but nostalgia and desire. The two way ladder between heaven and hell, on the threshold of the last mystery, at the brute absolute hour, you have looked into the eyes of your creature self, which are glazed with madness. And you say, he is not broken, but endures, limber and firm in the state of his shining forever inheriting his salt kingdom from which he is banished forever. The mulch. A man with a leaf in his head watches an indefatigable gull dropping a piss clam on the rocks to break it open. Repeat, repeat. He is an inlander who loves the margins of the sea and everywhere he goes, he carries a bag of earth on his back. Why is he down in the tide marsh? 
Why is he gathering salt hay in bushel baskets crammed to his chin? It is a northern sky and northern air, he says, as if the shiftings of the sky had taught him husbandry. Birthdays for him are when he wakes and falls into the news of the weather. Try, try, clicks the beetle in his wrist. His heart is an educated swamp, and he is mindful of his garden, which prepares to die. Boris Pasternak from Anna Akhmatova. He who has compared himself to the eye of a horse, peers, looks, sees, identifies, and instantly, like molten diamonds, puddles shine, ice grieves, and liquefies. In lilac mists, the backyards drowse, and depots, logs, leaves, clouds above, that hooting train, that crunch of watermelon rind, that timid hand in a perfumed kid glove, Falls ringing, roaring, grinding, breakers crash, and silence all at once. Release. It means he is tiptoeing over pine needles so as not to startle the light sleep of space. And it means he is counting the grains in the blasted ears. It means he has come again to the Dariel Gorge, accursed and black from another funeral. And again, Moscow where the heart's fever burns, far off the deadly sleigh bell chimes. Someone is lost two steps from home in waist-high snow, the worst of times. For spying Lake Aqua in a puff of smoke, for making a song out of graveyard thistles, for filling the world with a new sound, a verse reverberating in new space. He has been rewarded by a kind of eternal childhood with the generosity and brilliance of the stars. The whole of the earth was his to inherit and his to share with every human spirit. On my way home from school up Tribal Providence Hill past the Academy Ballpark, where I could never hope to play I scuffed in the drainage ditch among the sodden seethe of leaves, hunting the for perfect stones rolled out of glacial time into my pitcher's hand. Then sprinted lickety split on my magic keds from a crouching start, scarcely touching the ground with my flying skin as I poured it on for the prize of the mastery over the stretch of road with no one Nowhere to deny when I flung myself down that on the given course, I was the world's fastest human. Around the bend that tried to keep me, that tried to loop me home, dawdling came natural. Across the, the nettle field riddled with rabbit life, where the bees sank sugar wells in the trunks of the maples and a stringy old lilac more than two stories tall blazing with mildew, remembered a door in the long teeth of the woods. All of it happened slow. Brushing the, uh, the stick and, the, brushing the stickweed off, wading through jewel weed, strangled by angel's hair, spotting the print of a deer and the red fox's scats. Once I owned the key to an umbrageous trail thickened with mosses where flickering, flickering presences gave me rite of passage as I followed in the steps of straight-backed massessoir, soundlessly heel and toe, practicing my Indian walk. Past the abandoned quarry where the pale sun bobbed in the sump of the granite, past Copperhead Ledge where the ferns gave foothold, I walked deliberate onto the clearing with the stones in my pocket, changing to oracles, and my coiled ear turned to the slightest leaf stir. 
I had kept my appointment. There I stood in the shadow at 50 measured paces of the inexhaustible oak, tyrant and target, Jehovah of acorns, watchtower of the thunders that locked King Philip's war in its annulated core under the cut of my name. Father, wherever you are, I have only three throws. Bless my good right arm. In the haze of afternoon, while the air flowed saffron, I played my game for keeps, for love, for poetry, and for eternal life after the trials of summer. In the recurring dream, my mother stands in her bridal gown under the burning lilac with Bernard Shaw and Bertie Russell kissing her hands. The house behind her is in ruins. She's wearing an owl's face and makes barking noises. Her minatory finger points. I pass through the cardboard doorway, askew in the field, and peer down a well where an albino walrus huffs. He has the gentlest eyes. If the dirt keeps sifting in, staining the water yellow, why should I be blamed? Well, never try to explain. That single Model A sputtering up the grade unfurled a highway behind where the tanks maneuver, revolving their turrets. In the murderous time, the heart breaks and breaks and lives by breaking. It is necessary to go through dark and deeper dark and not to turn. I'm looking for the trail. Where's my testing tree? Oh, God. Give me back my stones. The knot, K-N-O-T. I tried to seal it in, that cross-grained knot on the opposite wall, scored in the lintel of my door, but it keeps bleeding through into the world we share. Mornings when I wake, curled in my web, I hear it come with a rush of resin out of the trauma of its lopping off. Obstinate bud, sticky with life, mad for the rain again. It racks itself with shoots that crackle overhead, dividing as they grow. Let be, let be. I shake my winds, wings and fly into its boughs. Kinapoxit. I was fishing in the abandoned reservoir back in Kinapoxit, where the snapping turtles cruised and the bullheads swayed in their bower of tree stumps, sleek as eels and pigeon fat. One of them gashed my thumb with a flick of his razor fin when I yanked the barb out of his gullet. The sun hung its terrible coals over Bureau's farm. I saw the treetops seething. They came suddenly into view on the Indian road, evenly stepping past the apple orchard, commingling with the dust they raised, their cloud of being against the dripping night, looming larger and bolder. She was wearing a mourning bonnet and a wrap of shining taffeta. Why don't you write, she cried from the folds of her veil. We never hear from you. I had nothing to say to her, but for him who walked behind her in his dark worsted suit with his face averted as if to hide a scald deep in his other life, I touched my forehead with my swollen thumb and splayed my fingers out in deaf mute country, the sign for father. The quarrel. The word I spoke in anger weighs less than a parsley seed, but a road runs through it that leads to my grave that bought and paid for a lot on a salt-sprayed hill in Truro where the scrub pines overlook the bay. Halfway, I'm dead enough, strayed from my own nature and my fierce hold on life. 
if I could cry, I'd cry. But I'm too old to be anybody's child. Liebchen, with whom should I quarrel except in the hiss of love, that harsh, irregular flame? Route six. The city squats on my back. I am heart sore, stiff necked, exasperated. That's why I slammed the door. That's why I tell you now in every house of marriage, there's room for an interpreter. Let's jump into the car, honey, and head straight for the cave where the cock on our housetop crows that the weather's fair and my garden waits for me to coax it into bloom. As for those passions left that flare past understanding like bundles of dead letters out of our previous lives that amaze us with their fevers, we can stow them in the rear along with zigonets of luggage. And Celia, our transcendental cat, past mistress of all languages, including Hottentot and silence, will drive nonstop till dawn. And if I grow sleepy at the wheel, you'll keep me awake by singing in your bravura, Chicago style, Ruth Edding, smoky song, love me or leave me, belting out the choices. Light glazes the Eastern sky over Buzzard's Bay. Celia gyrates upward like a performing seal. Her glistening nostrils a quiver to sniff the brine spiked air. The last stretch towards home. Twenty summers roll by. The layers. I have walked through many lives, some of them my own, and I am not who I was, though some principle of being abides from which I struggle not to stray. When I look behind, as I am compelled to look before I can gather strength to proceed on my journey, I see the milestones dwindling toward the horizon and the slow fires trailing from the abandoned campsites over which scavenger angels wheel on heavy wings. Oh, I have made myself tribe out of my true affections and my tribe is scattered how shall the heart be reconciled to its feast of losses? In a rising wind, the maniac dust of my friends, those who fell along the way, bitterly stings my face. Yet I turn. I turn, exulting somewhat with my will intact to go wherever I need to go, and every stone on the road precious to me. In my darkest night, when the moon was covered and I roamed through wreckage, a nimbus clouded voice directed me, live in the layers, not on the litter. Though I lack the art to decipher it, no doubt the next chapter in my book of transformations is already written. I am not done with my changes. Touch me. Summer is late, my heart. Words plucked out of the air some 40 years ago when I was wild with love and torn almost in two scatter like leaves this night of whistling wind and rain. It is my heart that's late. It is my song that's flown. Outdoors, all afternoon under a gunmetal sky staking my garden down, I kneeled to the crickets trilling underfoot as if about to burst from their crusty shells. And like a child again, marveled to hear so clear and brave a music pout from such a small machine. What makes the engine go? Desire? Desire? Desire. The longing for the dance stirs in the buried life. One season only, and it's done. So let the battered old willow thrash against the window panes and the house timbers creak. Darling, do you remember the man you married? Touch me. 
Remind me who I am. That was a spectacular reading. What a procession, a man's life. It was poignant, tender. It had uh, a deep resonance. Thank you all for your wonderful readings. And it's two o'clock. We made it. And uh, what a reading. Jennifer Clymer, it's up to you. Onward and upwards. Um, uh, we have a few extra minutes if you'd like to go around and get reflections. Um, exactly. Wonderful. Hey, thank you very much, Jennifer. Let's just start with, uh, as we see on the screen, let's start with Kay and then go over to Tony and across and then down to, Jen to uh, Corinne and then John. So, Kay, what do you think? Well, I was just very taken uh, when I first started to read, I thought, oh my God, I'm never going to get through this. <laughs> and as I read it and read it, it became so profound to me mm -hmm. and so beautiful. Um, he does seem to talk an awful lot about death. And uh, it's very sad, a lot of it made me very sad, but it's very beautiful. And oh, I love reading. Yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but you said death and as we all know, his father committed suicide right before he was born. So one of the elements or one of the themes is the search for the father. And uh, thank you, uh, Kay. And next is Tony. Well, I was very taken by um, one of the later ones, uh, which mentioned, I think Kay read it, Turo on the Cape coming from Massachusetts. I spent a lot of time in the Cape. And I, having read his background, the poet, uh, he had a place on the Cape, so I could close my eyes and remember all these places. I thought he he did that so beautifully. Uh, I could just, you know, imagine all that and send me back to my early days of going there frequently. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Helen? Uh, I feel he was a man who put life and death as one. Uh, he didn't separate the two, and this is quite prevalent, I think, in almost all the poems that we read. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Aaron? Well, I, I, I spent, I lived in Boston for a number of years and spent some time in the Cape myself, so it, it was also vivid to me. But um, mm -hmm. in particular, lovely girls now dead with whom I once lay. Mm. There are a few of those. <laughs> Corinne? Well, it was interesting to me uh, when I heard everyone read that the, the references to his father resonated with me so much because I had the poem, The Portrait, which starts, my mother never forgave my father for killing himself. And, and then kind of explains what the mother's like in two lines, especially mm -hmm. at, this t at this time of year. Uh, um, uh, at, you know, especially at the, and in a public park. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel as though th throughout his life he searched for his father. Certainly in so many of his poems, he referenced him and his need for his father. Uh, and the mother was always there um, like, like a bad conscience. Yeah. I could feel her in all the poems too. Yes, yeah, it's, it's wonderful to hear a, a, so many at the same time and you can reference one to the other, get a life out of that. And as you may know, Corinne, her, his mom took every evidence of his father and threw him out of the house so he never saw that, but uh, we have one more person, John Towie, if you're there, John. Yeah, I'm here, but I'll just quickly, um, <clears throat> you know, the father-son poem, um, and knowing that he never knew his dad, that he, you know, committed suicide a month before he was born, that poem is just uh, a desperate cry for him. There's one point, it's in italics, Father, return. Mm -hmm. And then this wonderful line yeah. that says, uh, his indomitable love kept me in chains. <laughs> I mean, the love that he never experienced from that man. But, you know, I'm sure that propelled him to do 
most of the poetry that he did. It's just such an unfulfilled mm -hmm. desire. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, anyway, that's, that's um, you know, his indomitable love kept me in chains and it probably kept him in chains most of his life. The fact that, I mean, I can't imagine if, if my father died before I knew him. Anyway, I, I just, I love his poetry. It's just so much beautiful stuff in it. And as you mentioned, John, that, that was the source of his creativity and his sorrow. Yeah. Uh, to creative people often that crux, yeah. the crucible, so to speak. But mm -hmm. thank you all once again. It was an enrapturing reading, one of our best. And thank you, Jennifer, for all that you do for poetry and for all of us with your three days a week live shows here on Creative Chaos MPTF.